Doctors could be on the brink of a breakthrough. Migraines. How to control them. Tame a migraine. A severe migraine. Throbbing, recurring headaches. Given all the noise, navigating the migraine experience can be confusing and scary, but you do not have to do it alone. Welcome to the Migraine Guy podcast, the official podcast of themigraineguy.com and theheadachereview.com. Now, here's your host. What is up, everyone? It's Kevin here, the Migraine Guy. This week's podcast is on time. We are doing Thursday podcast day, podcast Thursday. So how are you doing? If you're new to the podcast, I'm Kevin. I operate uh, a bunch of different social media areas that are known uh, under the name the Migraine Guy. We've got a Twitter, an Instagram, a YouTube, and a Facebook page, all with that name. Each of those tries to disseminate in different ways migraine information, uh, depending on the platform different things work better on different platforms, but we try to get out a bunch of information on each of those platforms. And by we, I mean me. Um, this podcast basically is broken up into four sections. The first section, this one is going to be about kind of, you know, things that are going on in my own personal migraine, uh, I don't know, walk experience, uh, day-to-day -day life. Uh, <laughs> the second part is going to be about migraine news. The third part gives kind of some migraine tips. And the fourth part gives kind of off-the-cuff ramblings as we close up. So let's get to this last week for me and my migraines. Thankfully, uh, if you were listening last week, then you heard that my insurance company had denied my doctor's uh, well, they didn't deny that I could get the medication my doctor wanted. They just said that they weren't going to cover a single penny for the amount of money that it was going to cost. And it was going to cost, without insurance, about $275. Now, this medication is time-release Topamax. Uh, the brand name that uh, the doctor wanted to use was Trokendi. There is another um, time-release Topamax that was an option. But he said that he preferred Trokendi for a number of reasons. So I wanted to go ahead and give it a try since I've not done time-release Topamax. I've just done a generic Topamax and did not like the side effects, but time release has a number of reasons that might, um, that it might, you know, bypass a lot of those side effects. So I was somewhat excited about it and then got the bad news from the insurance. Then someone informed me that the Trokendi website, um, offers a coupon program for 12 months worth of prescriptions where it, uh, reduces the amount of money. Now, you know, the coupon and the website advertises $0 for a 12 month, um, uh, 30 pill per month prescription. Uh, what it worked out to though was $12 a month. Um, so every month that I go in to pick up my 30 pills at 25 milligrams a pill prescription, I will pay $12 for the prescription. But $12 is significantly more affordable than $275 plus tax. And so I was very, very happy to um, have the pharmaceutical company offer such a discount for the medication. That is uh, a huge benefit to people in my circumstance where $300 basically out of your pocket every month for a medication that may or may not work probably would not be the kind of thing you'd be able to just swing automatically unless you were willing to cut a number of things in your budget. And my wife and I were really hoping that we weren't going to have to do that. And thankfully, this worked out. So I was very happy I didn't have to jump through a lot of hoops. I just had to uh, fill out the little application form on Trokendi's website, print off the uh, PDF and bring it to the pharmacist at the pharmacy. And they said, yep, everything looks good. This should work for a year. So that was pretty exciting. My neurologist was happy to hear about that too. Now, of course, what is weird about these kind of coupon programs, right? If you're a migraine sufferer, just a, a chronic pain sufferer who needs to try different medications because of the particular condition that they have, a lot of these companies have these kind of coupon programs, but your doctors and pharmacists are not aware of it. They're just not, they don't do that kind of stuff. For some reason, that's just not part of their overall uh, medical training. They don't get taught about ways in which that they can help patients uh, in general, at least reduce their overall medical costs. They do obviously have some things that they do, right? They give you a lot of samples of medications. Maybe they do one thing or another off the books for you. But in general, things like coupon programs from pharmaceutical companies aren't things that I or people that I know have 
been um, informed about by their medical professionals, kind of word of mouth from fellow people uh, who are patients in this area. So if you are not aware of these kind of coupon programs and you need a medication and either don't have insurance, um, God forbid, or you don't have insurance that covers the medication, definitely look into who makes that medication. Look who uh, look into other competitors for this medication and see if any of them offer coupons for it. Because if you can save uh, basically 97 or 98 percent, whatever it was for me, uh, in order to get the medication at an affordable rate, um, that is pretty great, especially um, given the fact that it could help. Now, I don't know that, you know, Trikendi is going to reduce my migraine frequency. There's no guarantee that it's going to. But uh, at the very least, uh, I'm not a, I'm not currently experiencing any of the negative side effects that generic Topamax gave me. And so if it doesn't change anything phenomenologically for me, if nothing about my day to day life changes, um, then at least it, it was just, you know, 12 bucks for uh, a month in order to try it out or 24 or 36 bucks, depending on how many months the neurologist wants me to try it. So um, I'm kind of optimistic right now only because I was able to save so much money. I just feel like, well, that was a good thing so that even if the medication doesn't help, that it didn't cost an arm and a leg in order to realize it wasn't going to help. So uh, uh, I'm feeling pretty good about that. I always like saving a buck. I am a pretty cheap guy. So saving money is kind of my life motto. So that being said, I'm going to keep you all updated on the Trokendi. I'll be throwing up some uh, generic uh, information about the medication on the YouTube channel and my uh, little medical or what do I call it? Medicine cabinet series, I think, uh, where I talk about the different medications that I've tried. So check that out when I put it up and look at the other medic medications that I have tried so far. And I'll be giving updates here and on YouTube about whether or not the medication actually helps reduce my migraine frequency. So here is hoping. But for now, let's get to some migraine news. All right, this week's bit of migraine news is going to be talking about a study that was published back in November on November 13th that is looking at whether or not there are any biochemical markers in migraine patients to determine whether or not Botox injections would be a good fit for that particular migraine sufferer or not. Are there any things that show that people who have Botox and see success have less overall migraine days per month? Do they have anything in their systems that indicate why the Botox would work versus those who don't see anything. Do they have anything different than those who see it working? That's what the study was looking uh, to do. Now, this is, I believe, the very first study to look at this, and so there's going to need to be a ton more studies afterwards to look at it. So this is very preliminary, but some of the things that they were looking at were very interesting. They looked at two particular things, uh, two things to measure in patients who had migraines and saw success from Botox injections and p uh, patients who had migraines but saw no success from Botox injections. The first thing were uh, was a CGRP levels. Now, if you have been paying attention to migraine news for the last couple of weeks, you have heard a host of uh, a host of things claimed about the upcoming CGRP medications, both their effectiveness in clinical trials, the fact that they're the first designed for migraine uh, medications, and the fact that they're going to cost an arm and a leg for the first couple of years. Um, that isn't exactly what the uh, CGRP levels are being looked at for the Botox levels, but I, I'm pretty sure, though it doesn't stay in the study, I'm assuming given that CGRP levels are so um, important, apparently, for migraine preventiveness, that correlating that with Botox injections was kind of the motivation behind looking at it in the study. Now, what did they find in the study? Well, Quite simply, they found that levels of CGRP were higher in patients who responded well to Botox treatment. Now, this also is not the first study that has noticed that CGRP was higher in migraine sufferers who responded well to Botox, though those studies weren't looking specifically at why Botox was more effective in certain patients than in others. But it is interesting that CGRP levels are much higher in um, Botox success uh, success cases than not. It also makes you wonder a little bit whether or not higher CGRP uh, levels are going to be correlated with uh, just general migraine um, 
uh, causation and with the upcoming meds. But at the very least, it is interesting that if you have higher CGRP levels, you are more likely to see Botox working in uh, uh, in your treatment plan than not. Now, the study, just to be clear before we get to the second factor that they looked at, I believe had 64 participants. Let me pull it up here real quick. It had 60, sorry, 62 participants. And so like all migraine studies, there is a little bit to, um, uh, uh, you know, hold loosely in these studies. It's hard to say how far they're going to generalize, but insofar as they are generalizable, it seems like CGRP being higher is correlated with Botox working better. Additionally, they looked at something called pentraxin 3 levels or PTX3 levels in your system. And those levels, um, P, uh, sorry, PTX3 has been linked with inflammatory and vascular issues in your body. And patients with higher PTX3 levels were also more likely to respond to Botox treatments. And that is also interesting as well in uh, wondering what could cause migraines, what might be a, an indicator of migraines, what might be something that you could look at to diagnose migraines. These two levels being higher in people who at least respond well to Botox could be some sort of causal, a piece of a causal story in, um, in relation to why migraines are occurring for these people. But at the very least, what this study is indicating is that these two compounds, CGRP and PTX3, are higher in patients who respond well to Botox treatment. And so if there is a way that you can talk your doctor into uh, doing some blood work to see what your levels are relative to what is considered normal, uh, such that you can be considered higher or lower, that might be an indicator for whether or not you should definitely consider looking into Botox or not. Right now, uh, many of the people I know who look into Botox kind of basically look at it like flipping a coin. Uh, it helps about one out of every two people. So what are you going to do? Do you think you're in the winner's circle or the loser's circle? Uh, on top of that, you also have to weigh the fact that Botox treatments don't just work the first time. You might not see any migraine relief until your second, third, or sometimes even fourth treatment cycle. And so even if you have all of these factors checked off on a box, you might not see any benefit for many, many weeks. You don't get the Botox done, but for every um, a certain number of weeks in between treatments, sometimes six, sometimes eight weeks in between. And so if it takes until your third cycle and you're doing six week cycles, you might have to wait, you know, 18 weeks before you really start to see a benefit. And so it's just something to keep in mind that even if you do have all of these factors checked off, that is no guarantee that the Botox is going to be automatically um, effective at helping your migraine. So something to keep in mind, definitely an interesting study, something very, very uh, promising. I, I really do like these diagnostic or, uh, oriented studies where they look at ways in which we can find out if we have migraines, uh, not necessarily find out, but point to something clinically or some, sorry, point to something beyond clinically, point to something beyond us telling doctors things. And they can say, no, no, they have these factors in their blood. They have these factors in uh, X, Y, and Z and they are indicative of migraine sufferers and makes it harder for insurance companies to deny things then. It also makes it harder for people to deny uh, that you have a particular symptom just because you don't quote look sick. And so I, I like these kind of studies. So um, especially the kind of studies that are gonna save you money by saying, well, you're probably not gonna see any benefit because your CGRP and PTX3 levels are fairly low. So I, I do like those kind of studies, but um, that is it for migraine news. I'm gonna put, uh, you know, as usual, all of the information to these studies in the show notes below. So make sure to click on them if you wanna find out more. But now let's get to this week's migraine tip of the week. All right, this week's migraine tip of the week has to do with migraine pain catastrophizing. Now, catastrophizing is a, a bit of a newer term, uh, both for psychology and for pain specialists, but there is a, a, a basic way of categorizing it. Basically, it's a combination of thoughts and emotions that are triggered in response to anticipated or actual physical and emotional pain. Now, individuals differ in how they perceive pain. We all know that. They also differ in how they react to any given painful experience. We also know that some, for example, can work through the pain and make it through the day while others think about their pain constantly, worry when it will end, and are very, very scared about how much worse it is going to get. 
This negative emotional response to pain is called pain catastrophizing, and it's been a subject of a number of uh, bits of research. Pain researchers typically measure pain catastrophizing, and by the way, this isn't a lot of the pain research that we're going to be talking about in this section, don't have necessarily to do with migraine pain, it has to do with general pain catastrophizing. So people with different painful conditions, whether they're surgery related, strain related, uh, uh, genetic related, or something else, they, uh, as so far as pain is the same in all of those circumstances, they report this condition that can be generalized and dubbed pain catastrophizing. So just important to remember that a lot of these people don't uh, experience migraine specifically, but they have uh, fairly painful conditions themselves. And so insofar as we can learn from other pain patients, other pain, uh, chronic pain patients, then we should uh, uh, be at least aware of this thing called pain catastrophizing. Now, as I was saying, pain researchers measure pain catastrophizing using a scale that captures three main components. The first component is rumination, the second magnification, and the third helplessness. Patients with chronic pain who ruminate may say, I worry about whether the pain will end. Patients who magnify their pain may remark, I keep thinking about how much it hurts. While those who feel helpless may say something like, it's awful and I feel that my pain overwhelms me. Patients who score high on the catastrophizing scale have poorer clinical outcomes in the shorter and long term. Reporting less improvement in pain and physical functioning also is correlated with higher pain catastrophizing. So basically, and this is going to sound a little harsh, but it basically means that the more negative you view your pain, the more negative you view your circumstances in relation to your pain, and the more you worry about your pain, the worse your overall circumstance is going to be. Now, on the one hand, you might think, well, duh, yeah, the more negative I think about my life, the worse my life's going to be because I'm going to be perceiving my life through this negative psychological mesh. And that's exactly right. That is the point. That's what catastrophizing is. It's where you take your pain and let it, and let it become the lens by which you see the world. And it is extremely easy to slip into at least catastrophizing phases. I certainly am guilty of, uh, at times, when my migraine pain is so intense and so unending and has lasted for such a long time, whether hours or sometimes days, that I just think, when is this going to end? I want this to end. Maybe, you know, you have those thoughts where you just want to die. You uh, kind of worry all the time about whether a painful experience will end. You feel like you can't go on. You keep thinking about the pain and how bad it is and wish it would stop. And you can't get the, the, the sensation of pain out of your mind. All of these things are very, very normal psychological factors for migraine sufferers and for chronic pain sufferers in general. The downside to it, as natural as it is, is that it means that we're actually going to have worse painful experiences because of that psychology. And so to the extent that we can start to alter that psychology is the extent to which we can see at least some minor mild reduction in our overall painful experiences. It's certainly not a cure. It's certainly not going to stop a, a terrible migraine from uh, being debilitating, sending you to the ER, making you pop your uh, abortives or anything like that. But to the extent that your life can be more livable and more pleasant, pain catastrophizing is getting in the way. Now, the question isn't whether or not we're all going to pain catastrophize because we almost all certainly are, at least for a time. The thing is, what can we do about it? Well, there isn't a ton you can do about it apart from a few things. First thing you can do is try to come up with some sort of meditative plan. The, the, uh, the benefit of meditation rituals, and this isn't any sort of religious meditation necessarily, just the kind of meditation where you're calming your breathing, focusing on uh, physical sensations and, and being aware of your thoughts without engaging in your thoughts, those kind of uh, practices help you see and, you know, this is all metaphorical, see and hear those thoughts, those very, very negative catastrophizing thoughts, but not engage them. And when you see them and hear them without engaging them, you can be aware of them and let them go. And when you do that, then those thoughts aren't necessarily, you know, 
quote part of you they don't become internalized you're just aware that they're there in your your mind and then they dissolve and go away but you can't always do that and we all know that it would be wonderful if we could enter some tranquil uh, 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 meditative bliss every time our migraines made us feel lousy and then just wait it out and then we'd be okay I mean maybe we can but I feel like many of us are gonna falter on that path because it's so rigorous and demanding and many of us are just are, are beaten down by our migraines so often that it will help but it's certainly not the only thing we can do so what else can we do well I think there's two very very important things we can do to combat catastrophizing the first very important thing and the first easiest thing we can do is to be in a supportive environment now supportive environment doesn't necessarily mean the people that you physically engage with every day your coworkers, your family your friends certainly it doesn't have to be limited to that though if those people are your support group that is awesome because not only do you get to have them uh, hear you and listen to you you also get to see them um, they can give you hugs they can provide meals for you they can bring you ice packs that kind of stuff so that is awesome if they're close but if they're not uh, in close physical proximity for uh, to you you need to get some sort of online support group migraine.com has a huge community of people who respond uh, as does migraineagain.com and if you like the migraine guy and the stuff that I do then the migraine guy support group on Facebook just search the migraine guy support group has a lot of members that are um, both extremely active and very supportive and very protective we do not tolerate any sort of uh, BS by people trying to sell you any sort of uh, snake oil cures or get rich quick schemes off of migraine sufferers. So, and the benefit, of course, to uh, the the way to combat catastrophizing is to vent, is to get out the negative stuff that's inside of you that you're thinking because once you say it and talk about it with other people it loses a lot of its power over you psychologically because you realize to some extent that things aren't as bad as they seem the both though there there are many people in our support group whose whose lives are quite ruined by their migraines and so talking about it doesn't uh, provide some sort of uh, fix to your life but it helps change your psychology a little bit because you'll know that other people like you do exist and other people like you are finding ways to get by in life and want you to get by they want you to succeed they think you are valuable and you are not alone in this and so that is one big thing you can do the second thing you can do uh, besides getting a support group and doing some sort of meditative uh, mindfulness uh, meditation is to go see a psychiatrist or a therapist of some kind and talk to someone who uh, is going to validate validate your experiences who is going to listen to what you're saying and give you uh, the ability to vent and to talk and to uh, whine and to share your you know very very embarrassing thoughts perhaps you are feeling suicidal for perhaps you are thinking about giving up perhaps you are thinking about leaving your family because you don't feel like you're a good parent or a good spouse or a good partner all of those things are very natural and will build up and eat you alive inside if you let them and so catastrophizing has this very and not only that but it's gonna make your pain feel that much worse when you do get migraines they're gonna be eating you up even more because there's this real psychological component to the pain and not just the sensation of pain itself and so it's it's just very important to have outlets have ways to try to discipline yourself through mindfulness meditation and those kind of things to be aware of your thoughts without letting them consume you but you can't also expect to be the entire master of your mind you have to have an outlet to connect with other people whether it's a, a support group in person or online or a, a therapist or a psychiatrist or psychologist of some kind to whom you can be honest with because being honest helps break some of this cycle and so it's just very important to do and it's something uh, that we've touched on a couple times on the podcast so far but I, I do know right that depression rates with migraine are much higher than the normal population and um, I know that loneliness and, and people feeling uh, perhaps abandoned but it, at the very least very very helpless and hopeless uh, is fairly common in the migraine community at least when we're talking about more severe migraine circumstances or things like spouses disapproving of your uh, choice to take a medication because you're feeling bad or kids uh, uh, feeling like your kids are looking down on you because you can't go to whatever function uh, even if it's not true you just feel that way uh, as well as many of the other things that go along with being a chronic migraine sufferer or even uh, just an episodic migraine sufferer and so um, it's just very important to keep in mind that uh, the 
um, catastrophizing aspect can make it worse. And so even if we don't want to fight it, it will make our migraines less bad if we do fight it. And so catastrophizing is bad. There's lots of research out there to support it, which I'm going to link to in the show notes below. Please find a support group of some kind that you can connect with so that you are not alone. And that is it for this migraines tip of the week. Let's get to the close. Well, 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 just like that, we are wrapping up another week of the podcast. We're closing in on our 30th podcast. I believe it's going to be at the end of December. We're going to hit number three zero, which is pretty crazy. Started this back when it was the end of July or June and, uh, you know, been growing uh, downloads, been growing subscribers, been growing um, migraine awareness, which is the most important thing. So thanks to every single person who downloads the podcast. I know sometimes you got to miss a week or two weeks or a month, and then you kind of cram them all in. Doesn't matter how you listen to it. I'm just happy that you're listening. Hit me up on social media. Let me know anything that you would like to hear in this podcast. If you have news articles of your own, you would like discussed research, you would like me to talk about, hit me up. Uh, just search the migraine guy on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Let me know what you would like to know. If there's anything you want on the podcast that isn't here, if you want a different section added to the podcast, rather than just the little intro about me, migraine news, then migraine tips. If you want something else in there, let me know. If you have any tips about, you know, some of the audio levels and stuff, we've been working on getting that more precise these last couple weeks. Uh, apparently last week, the music interlude between sections was too low. The previous weeks, apparently it was way too high. So we're, uh, you know, doing the Goldilocks approach here. Hopefully this week it'll be just right. Anything else you want to talk about, let me know. Also make sure to hit up uh, the migraine guy on YouTube. I'm getting the uh, the videos pouring back out. Got to edit a bunch of them. But they are going to be uh, coming out in the next couple weeks. We're going to be doing uh, some stuff, as I said, about medications. We're going to be doing giveaways and a whole bunch of other things. So make sure to go over to youtube.com slash the migraine guy and subscribe. We're closing in on 1,000 subscribers over on YouTube, which is pretty wild. So if you want to be number 1,000, go over and hit that subscribe button. It is almost as satisfying as skip ad. I stole that joke from a late night host. I'll let you guess which one. Um, anything else going on this week? I don't think so. I just want to say thank you again for listening. And until next week, please remember, Migraine community, that you are not alone. If you want to help keep everything that the Migraine Guy does free, then you can become a patron over at the website patreon.com. That's P A T R E O N. Dot com. Patreon lets people contribute funds to other people whose work they value. Becoming a patron does things for me, such as allowing me to buy new products so that I can do product review videos so that you know whether or not a uh, given migraine product actually works before you buy it. It also helps me do things like upgrade the microphones and cameras for both the YouTube channel and this podcast. And more importantly, it helps me be accountable to you, my migraine community. You can pledge as low as a dollar a month if you want to and every single dollar does help just head over to patreon.com slash the migraine guide to become a patron today